Good evening to those who are joining us from Asia and good morning and good afternoon to those of you who are in the Americas, Africa and Europe. On behalf of the India China Institute at the New School, I would like to welcome all of you to a panel on the responses of India and China to the war in Ukraine. This panel is co-sponsored by the India China Institute, the Global Studies Program and the Julian Studley Graduate Programs in International Affairs at the New School University. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India-China Institute. Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce our panel's distinguished speakers. Over the last two months, the deeply disturbing news and images of Russia's invasion of Ukraine have dominated our news. While Russia's actions have prompted immediate censure and sanctions by Western governments, it has been met with a more mixed response from China and India. On the one hand, both China's and India's governments have issued multiple statements deploring the harm to civilians and destruction in Ukraine. But on the other hand, for different reasons, both countries have abstained from United Nations resolutions condemning Russia, they have resisted calls to roundly condemning Russian actions, and they have sought ways to avoid having to choose sides with either the US-led coalition or Russia. So today's panel has been conveyed, convened to help us understand the responses of these two powerful large Asian countries, to help us appreciate the historical, economic, and strategic interests and worldviews that drives their responses, and also perhaps appreciate how in these responses are indications of broader shifts that might be underway in the global geopolitical and normative order. Today, we are very lucky to have with us distinguished foreign policy analysts from both India and China. Our first speaker will be Ambassador Shyam Saran, who is a senior fellow and member of the governing board at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. He is a former foreign secretary of India. Um, he has served as the prime minister's special envoy for nuclear affairs and climate change. And he was chairman of the National Security Advisory Board under the National Security Council. Um, the list of his awards, positions, and achievements is much longer, but let me just mention that Ambassador Saran is also author of the book, How India Sees the World, published in 2017. Our second speaker today is going to be Professor Lu, who is a research fellow at the Institute of the Belt and Road Initiative at Tsinghua University, where she has been working on China's various regional cooperation programs. Her broader research area is in international politics with a focus on China's relations with India and broader South Asia and with Germany and broader Europe. Before her current position at Tsinghua University, she was a lecturer at the South Asia Institute at Heidelberg University. I should note that she was the recipient of ICI's China India Scholar Leaders Fellowship a few years ago. Uh, Professor Liu has published a large number of academic articles and opinions pieces, um, and she also regularly provides television commentary on news related to South Asia and the Belt Road Initiative. Our third speaker today will be Professor Nimi Kurian, who is also at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Her work focuses on the border regions between South Asia and Southeast Asia, India's neighborhood policy, federalism and foreign policy, transboundary water politics, and comparative regionalism. Um, her list of positions and achievements is also very long, but let me simply note that Professor Kurian has long been a friend and affiliate of the India-China Institute and currently serves on the ICI's external advisory board. Um, she has written and published widely on alternative spatial imaginations of South Asia, a theme that is explored in detail in her two books which are India-China Borderlands, Conversations Beyond the Center, which was published in 2014, and India and China Rethinking Borders and Security, published in 2016. Our final panelist today will be Professor Da, who is the Director of the Center for International Security and Strategy and Professor in the School of Social Sciences at Tsinghua University. Um, professor Da's research covers China-US relations and US security and foreign policy. Prior to his current position, he was the assistant president of the University of International Relations and director of the Institute of American Studies at China's Institutes of Contemporary International Relations. 
Um, he has written hundreds of policy papers for the Chinese government and published dozens of academic papers in journals in China, the US and other countries. Um, I should also like to note that we also have with us today my ICI co-director and colleague, Professor Mark Fraser, um, who's Professor of Politics at the New School. Um, Professor Fraser will be moderating the Q&A session. So we will be requesting the audience to put their questions into the Q&A box. The, um, the chat function will not be available to the audience. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Ambassador Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Manjari, and uh, I would like to thank the India-China Institute for inviting me to speak on what is uh, perhaps uh, one of the most topical subjects one could find. Um, uh, how, many, how much time would you uh, give me to make my presentation, say about uh, five to ten minutes? or um, So I think um, 10 to 11, 10 to 12 minutes is fine. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me uh, begin by uh, saying that you know um, what I will be presenting is an Indian perspective, which may not necessarily at all points be the government of India perspective, <clears throat> because I'm looking at uh, you know what has been happening also through the eyes uh, of an analyst and uh, looking at what the implications could be of uh, what is taking place uh, in Europe. So let me begin by uh, saying that um, it is clear to me that uh, whatever may be the statements made by the government of India, there is a deep concern over the fact that uh, there is uh, a, a violation of the territorial integrity and the uh, sovereignty of an independent uh, state, a state with which India also has had very close uh, relations. So, uh, whatever may be the legacy of very close uh, Indo-Soviet relations uh, and later on uh, the legacy that continued uh, under the Russian Federation, uh, there is no doubt that uh, there is deep concern uh, to a certain extent even alarm at what has been happening in Ukraine. And that is not only in terms of the implications for India-Russia relations, but uh, what we see as uh, this uh, being one of those defining moments in history where perhaps there could be major shifts in uh, you know, interstate relations, global equations, the whole geopolitical landscape, uh, I think, uh, has, has uh, now come to an inflection point in a, in a sense. Uh, so the uncertainty, the unpredictability that this creates uh, is, of course, something that uh, is uh, creating some anxiety uh, in India. Uh, what has been the reason why there has been perhaps uh, in terms of India-Russian relations, uh, you mentioned that there has been perhaps a, a hesitation on the part of India uh, to join the very public condemnation of Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, India continues to be somewhat uh, heavily dependent upon uh, Russia uh, for much of its uh, military assets, even though there has been a process of diversification of our arms supplies and uh, uh, sources of technology. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, because typically, you know, weapon systems uh, uh, last for something like 30 to 40 years, uh, there is a, a great, great deal of dependence on spare parts, on maintenance, uh, on Russia. And by the way, it's not only Russia, but a lot of the items that are Russian in origin, uh, a lot of the spares, a lot of the uh, maintenance support uh, come actually from Ukraine because much of the uh, defense industry during the Soviet days was also located in, in Ukraine. So there is, there is an, a... a uh, anxiety, I would say, as to what will happen in terms of this uh, relationship. Uh, secondly, um, there is a there is a, a, a certain assumption that India had made, uh, which assumption is perhaps no longer valid. Is that's that's the question being asked? What is that assumption? The assumption was that despite the fact that uh, Russia has moved very much closer to uh, China. And we have seen on February 4 that it's almost been 
uh, announced that uh, there are no limits uh, to Russian uh, Chinese relations, that there are no forbidden areas of cooperation. Um, the fact is that the Indian assumption has been that Russia is at the end of the day still a great power. Uh, it would not like to be reduced to a position of being a supplicant or a junior partner uh, in any kind of a relationship that if we are looking at uh, Russia's you know, longer term concerns, uh, what it describes as its near neighborhood, say in Central Asia or Eastern Europe, uh, these are precisely the area where the, the power which is advancing uh, most rapidly is China, uh, with its Belt and Road Initiative, with its much stronger relationship with uh, countries in Central Asia, the 17 plus one forum with um, many countries in, in Europe. Uh, so if um, uh, Russia is concerned about what its sphere of influence uh, could be, uh, the country which perhaps uh, potentially can be its greatest rival is China. Uh, so there has been an assumption in India that at the end of the day, you know, Russia, Russia will continue to maintain a somewhat independent posture with regard to uh, China. Uh, is that assumption any longer correct? <laughs> this has become a question mark, frankly speaking. Uh, because even if that may be uh, the uh, sentiment uh, in Russia, uh, can it afford to, in fact, uh, uh, reduce its dependence upon China? I think there is a likelihood of much greater dependence on China going forward, uh, particularly because of the sanctions which have been, the sweeping sanctions which have been imposed uh, on, on uh, Russia. So what does that mean uh, for India-Russia relations? Uh, if, if Russia is going to be so deeply committed uh, to uh, China. The other element which uh, perhaps is of uh, concern to India, which is a larger question, is what we see in terms of, you know, the, uh, the, these uh, sweeping sanctions that have been uh, imposed historically without uh, precedent, and the fact that these now involve uh, the global financial system. So even though there has been protectionism, even though there has been perhaps, uh, you know, more barriers to, you know, global trade, the financial system was still very, very much globalized. You know, the banking system, the, uh, you know, investment, uh, you know, regime. Uh, and uh, what we find is that, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a ledger entry which can wipe out uh, the, uh, the reserves that you have because of the domination of the uh, US dollar and the domination of the global financial markets by the uh, West uh, in general. Uh, and what does this mean uh, for India's uh, you know, financial security uh, going forward? Uh, by the way, this is not only a concern in India. I think you will find this concern uh, across the world, including amongst uh, European uh, allies of the US uh, itself. So what does this mean in terms of, you know, our, our integration with the global economy, uh, which has been also a source of, uh, you know, growth uh, for India, as, as it has been for China uh, as well. Uh, we find that that vulnerability uh, is a very real one. Uh, lastly, I would say that, uh, you know, what I mentioned in terms of the geopolitical landscape, uh, you know, perhaps we had not anticipated that right in the middle of Europe, <laughs> there could be actually a war of such barbarity, uh, such violence, uh, which would uh, erupt. Uh, and what does this mean, uh, you know, for the future uh, of not just European security, but since we are such an interconnected world, we are such a highly, you know, globalized world. Uh, no owner of the world is going to be, uh, you know, immune from the impact of this uh, of this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we already see, for example, the inflationary trends, which were already visible before. These are probably going to be uh, much more intensified. Uh, we are uh, uh, also seeing that the supply chain disruptions uh, that had taken place as a result of the pandemic are perhaps becoming even more uh, serious. Uh, as a result of this crisis, look at the food security issue for most of African countries. Uh, you know, uh, there, is, there is impact all around. And, but it is also showing, uh, and this is, I, we hope that this lesson is done, that now there are limits to the exercise of coercive power. This is the latest example where the use of coercive power by a, a major power to try and influence 
uh, a neighboring country or another country, uh, it has simply not delivered on whatever objectives they may have. Uh, whether it was the US intervention in Iraq or in Afghanistan, uh, these wars ended with no outcome that could be described as any kind of a political again. And I certainly believe that Russia has already lost this war. Uh, if it is leaves Ukraine in, in as a rubble, uh, what would it have gained? You know, uh, if the uh, result of this has been that it has won the uh, you know, uh, the kind of hatred uh, and, and uh, you know, resentment of uh, a very large population uh, of Ukrainians. Uh, is any victory worth uh, the name, in a sense? You know, uh, perhaps a guerrilla war <laughs> will probably continue for a long time. Uh, so Russia has obviously not learned the lessons of its own defeat uh, in Afghanistan looked at what has been the humbling of the United States in Iraq and then latest in Afghanistan, uh, and it has embarked on this adventure. Uh, Russia will emerge from this a much diminished power. Uh, does the, what does this mean uh, in terms of the global political equations? Uh, I do not think that, for example, the, the long-term decline of the United States in relative terms, uh, not in absolute terms, is still the most formidable you know, economic and military power in the world. But in relative terms, that is not going to stop. Uh, I, if China plays its cards well, uh, it will probably continue, in fact, to become a, a, an even uh, stronger power. And that has implications <laughs> for India. Uh, if the United States of America is going to be much more engaged in Europe, it cannot uh, be much more engaged in, in Asia. Uh, and it means, therefore, that whatever may be India's view of geopolitics in Asia, much of that shaping uh, will have to be perhaps done by Asia itself. Uh, and India will have to watch out uh, for its interest. Let me stop here and maybe some of these issues we can to take up in the question and answer session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Saran. Um, our next, we'll take questions at the end. So let's just go to the next speaker, who is Professor Lu. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to meet you here again. And thank you for the invitation of Indian China Institute. Uh, that uh, I can also uh, share my views with you on this very uh, hot topic. And I think this is a very uh, in-time uh, discussions on the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict. Um, I will first uh, to summarize some Chinese uh, uh, positions and Chinese views uh, at the beginning of uh, my uh, speech. And secondly, I would go through uh, China, uh, China, Russia relationships. At the end, I would talk a little bit about current China India relationship with regard to the uh, Ukraine and uh, Russian crisis. Um, so far, it has been already one and a half months, and China watched the uh, development of the situation closely and has been keeping neutral position towards the conflict. Uh, since uh, the outbreak of conflict, China has conducted active diplomatic work and talked with leaders and high level officials of uh, related parties. Um, Chinese President Xi Jinping talked with Putin, uh, with Joe Biden, and held three party meeting with German Prime Minister Schulz and French President Macron meet leaders of the European Union, von der Leyen and Michel, during China and European Union's 23rd summit. China expressed uh, its views towards uh, the conflicts at all these uh, occasions. And firstly, um, China's position is based on independent judgment of the crisis situation, the security concerns of the related parties and the facts of the Ukraine issues. And secondly, China criticizes the Cold War mentality and logic of 
camp confrontation respect the reasonable security concerns of all countries, advocates dialogue and negotiations to resolve problems, not by force. Thirdly, emphasizes the importance of United Nations Charter, respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, uphold international systems with the United Nations at its core and uphold the international order based on international law. Fourth, on humanitarian aid, all parties should exercise maximum restraint, protect civilians, and prevent large-scale humanitarian crisis. China is ready to provide further humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and other countries affected. Fifth, uh, it advocates a concept of common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security, not absolute security at the cost of insecurity of other countries. And six, it opposes using all round economic sanctions as weapons against the country. The sanctions has caused serious crisis in world finance, trade, energy, science and technology, food, and supply chain, which has kidnapped other countries as well. Uh, seventh, China will continue to play a constructive role in establishing a balanced, effective, and sustainable global and regional security architecture. China will support a dialogue between Europe, Russia, the United States, and NATO, and promote the building of a balanced, effective, and sustainable European security framework. Um, the world broke out against the background that China-Russia strategic partnership has reached a new height. Uh, on February 4th, uh, Putin visited China um, during the Winter Olympic Games, and China-Russia issued a joint statement. In these statements, um, uh, it's some uh, this uh, summarized views shared by Beijing and Moscow on international relations and global sustainable uh, development. Both opposes attempts by external forces to undermine security and, and stability in the common neighboring region of the two countries. Uh, they affirm that the new uh, relations between China and Russia are superior to political and military alliances of the Cold War era. And very importantly in this statement, it says that friendship between the two states has no limits and there are no forbidden areas of uh, cooperation. And the joint statement actually has attractive uh, high attention, and it also foreshadows subsequent Western doubts about China's position that China knew Putin's military actions in advance, and China is back Putin. I mean, the, the, the expression in the, uh, in the uh, joint statement that, uh, that the cooperation that has no limits is indeed uh, give uh, some, some reasons uh, for, these, uh, for, for Western countries' position. But in fact, China did not expect Russian military operations at all. Um, China has good relationship with Ukraine as well. And China has many projects in Ukraine. Um, shortly before the outbreak of war, more than 6,000 Chinese people work, study, and live in Ukraine. If China could be prepared, it would not have withdrawn Chinese citizens in Ukraine so hastily. Um, the Putin's action put China in a very discomfort situation. China has to face accusation and pressure from the Western countries. They think China is able to influence uh, Russia's position, but in fact, China could not. Um, I quite agree with um, um, Ambassador Sharon's uh, judgment that Russia is much more independent and uh, international actor. Uh, it's, it has this kind of capability and willingness to act very independently. So China refused uh, to condemn Russia and has further strengthened the tensions between China and Western countries. Uh, 
China has indeed very good relationship with Russia, but China has also its independent national interests. China's strategic relationship with Russia should not undermine China's national core interest. Although China does not condemn Russia, it also sets limits and avoids to be involved excessively. China respects sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. Russia has its security concerns, but legitimated by invading a sovereign country is not the right way. If China sides for Russian position, it will make the Taiwan issue extremely dangerous as well. China reiterates the view that all diplomatic efforts should foster negotiation. Related parties should abandon the approach of joint ideological lines and Cold War mindset. Um, unfortunately, not only more weapons have been sent into Ukraine, more economic sanctions are coming out, but also China's threat was deliberately played up. Uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg recently said NATO's next iteration of its strategic concept will for the first time take account of the systemic challenges to the security of democracies posed by China's growing influence and coercive policies. It was also for the first time that foreign ministers from the United States Indo-Pacific allies Austria, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea participated as a group in a NATO ministerial meeting. NATO's eastward expansion is at the core of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and now it moves to deepen cooperation with Asia-Pacific partners to build a new form of military alliance. That displays a very dangerous trend. There is another trend to be observed that is the politicization of conflicts has also caused serious spillover effect in cultural and sports fields and along racial and ethnic lines. For example, Ukrainian and ethnic groups uh, in uh, Ukraine received differential treatments in evacuation after war broke out in Ukraine. We also see lots of reports about Indian students was sustained um, at the border regions. And Russophobia sentiments has begun to spread. Uh, for example, in Germany, Russians are discriminated and that caused several protests in Germany as well, because in Germany, there are some districts and there's, um, there's lots of Russians uh, and re Russians residential areas. And after the war broke out, the attitudes towards Russia has uh, changed a lot. Uh, um, and this caused troubles in Germany as well. And Russian artists and athletes were banned. Russian musicians and artworks were banned, uh, were, allow, were not allowed to play publicly. All their works are renamed. All these have alerted us that the ghost of Cold War is hovering. Different from other regional conflicts in the past decades, such as the ones in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has led to a very serious global political and economic consequences. Due to the weaponization of economic sanctions, the subsequent energy and food crisis and distorted supply chain would dominate the future trend of global economic in the coming years. It will also have strong vibration in international order. The Ukraine crisis stems from the security imbalance in Europe, and so far, established security agreements and mechanisms have lost their efficacy. China has been in its own way to promote peace and talks in the region, and will support rebuild the balance, effective and sustainable European security framework based on the principle of inseparable security so as to truly achieve long-term peace. Um, the most important thing at the time is not to add fuel to the fight to, escal to escalate the conflict, not to tie the whole world to Ukraine crisis. Rather than acting impulsively and emotionally, politicians need to be sober to think through the consequences from the long-term perspective and make their policies. So I think I almost run out of time. I will also talk a little bit about current China-India relations. 
Um, I think uh, amid Ukraine crisis, uh, um, um, or, or Ukraine has actually gives uh, some positive impact towards the China uh, India relations. Amid Ukraine crisis, India also acts very independently according to its interests and did not follow the US instructions. Indians uh, plays a very important role in social media and to some extent neutralized uh, Western media narratives on Russia on major social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook. With regard to China-India relations, China's reaction in the crisis has positive impact about Chinese perceptions about India. Previously, the narrative that India has joined the US to contain China and deviated its non-aligned position is dominant in Chinese media and in scholarly work. This time, more Chinese have become aware that India is also pursuing an independent foreign policy, just like China. China and India have their own problems, which cannot be solved in the short term. The neutral position taken by India in Ukraine crisis does not mean that China-India relations can be quickly improved. However, China can make a more lucid and objective judgment of India's behavior. And I think it is very helpful to the future development of Indian-China relations. Um, so I think let me uh, end here and give the time to the uh, other panelists and we will continue our discussions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lu, for your comments. Um, and now we'll move to our third panelist, Professor Kurie. Thank you, Manjri. Uh, let me also join my co-panelists uh, to, th uh, to thank the ICI for convening this um, timely conversation. And it's great to be back at the ICI. Uh, so what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to look at three things. I'd like to look at the politics of framing a little more closely to try and understand how India has framed the issue. Next, I'd like to look at the reasons why I think the Indian response is problematic on several counts. Lastly, I'd like to ask the question, to what extent has India's response served or is likely to serve India's interests going forward? So let me then begin with a couple of things that really stood out for me. First and foremost, what, stru what struck me uh, well, is the rather simplistic framing of the issue as a Russia versus Ukraine problem. Now, ostensibly, one could argue that this appears to be because India wants to avoid having to make uncomfortable choices, uh, wants to avoid taking sides. And hence, one could argue that there's a clear preference for ambivalence as a political strategy. But I think there's more to this that meets the eye. This is ambivalence with a difference. And this, I would argue, is ambivalence by design. And there's a reason it is so. It serves, in my opinion, two critical political purposes for Indian foreign policy. Firstly, I think this sort of framing allows it to sit out some of the larger normative questions that rise from Russia's actions. And these have to do with the violation of international law, because Russia's actions cannot be justified either as an act of self-defense or as humanitarian intervention. Secondly, the controversial, India's controversial decision to abstain from all UN General Assembly resolutions, I think a total of seven re re resolutions, I think, Security Council uh, resolutions and the Human Rights Council. Incidentally, India was re-elected to the HRC in January this year with an overwhelming majority for a, a term of three years. These abstentions have allowed India to signal its support to, uh, to, to Russia. So, so I agree that the tone and tenor of uh, India's responses have shown some notable uh, shifts over the weeks, but on the whole, India has chosen a stance of what it believes is one of strict neutrality. It's another matter that others don't quite see it that way. In fact, just last week, President Biden's economic advisor warned India of the costs of aligning with Russia. So does this then mean that India is solving the wrong problem? I'd say it's more likely to be a case of not knowing what the problem is. 
because by defining it as a bilateral crisis, it has lost sight of the fact that this is a fundamental crisis in the European security order. And that in both Europe, as well as in Russia, there are legitimate security interests that need to be addressed for any lasting peace. So the question Indian foreign policy really needs to debate is, what will be the impact its willful blindness have on its potential role as an interlocutor? And unless it re recognizes this, how can India hope to get all sides around the table? So what are, what are the likely consequences of this going forward? Going forward, I'd say ambivalence would have high political costs. The, and I'm glad Manjri mentioned uh, in her initial comments uh, uh, the normative dimension, because the first consequence of this will be that it will induce a growing dissonance between the strategic and normative positions taken by India. A quick example to give you a sense of what I'm driving at, a good place to look for this dissonance is India's official statement after it abstained from the UN Security Council uh, resolution of February 25th. I think India's statement is important for what it does not say than what it does. There are two things that, are, that India does not say in this explanation of no, uh, the vote as it is called. Firstly, India does not mention Russia and does not, you know, as, as is known, does not deplore uh, the invasion. Secondly, India calls for, and this is really intriguing. Secondly, India calls for de-escalation of the conflict by those involved. Thus, in one stroke, India ends up equating Russia and Ukraine as if both countries were belligerents, when in fact, there's an obvious aggressor and the other is a victim. So by equating the two, I would argue India ostensibly serves its strategic interests, but undercuts its normative power in damaging ways. So, and the, the strategic normative binary is a false binary. And as Rousseau warned us, those who treat politics and morality separately will end up understanding neither. The second consequence, in my opinion, of this is that there is a certain normative diffidence um, um, that one notices in India's responses on even non-strategic issues. That is at odds with it, India's geo, uh, you know, larger global South positioning, at least at the rhetorical level. Take, for instance, Europe's handling of the refugee crisis, despite the show of uh, solidarity and rallying ground by European states to take in the influx of refugees, there are clear instances of cultural bordering that are premised on what I've argued elsewhere, an implicit notion of the European, uh, of um, a notion of the Ukrainian being a quote unquote good refugee as against let's say the Afghan, the Syrian or the Yemeni. And these speak to larger institutionalized biases within uh, EU's decision-making processes that are changing the notion of the, of the border in fundamental ways with enormous consequences for the rights of the, of, the, of the vulnerable. Now, these are not questions that are happening in a geographically distant part of the world that have no relevance for India. In fact, India will have to find answer, answers to the very same questions in its own neighborhood where it's confronted with a sizable stateless population. And there are huge concerns within the government circles that India could end up becoming the refugee capital of the world. There are, for instance, um, 918,000 Rohingya refugees uh, at present in the refugee camps in Kutupalong in Bangladesh, next door to India, which is incidentally the largest refugee camp in the world. So going forward, there's, there's one crisis that India simply cannot sit out, and that's the one within its immediate region, South Asia. And Ambassador Saran rightly mentioned that no corner of the world is immune from this crisis and South Asia is staring at a looming economic slowdown brought, out, brought about by the, uh, you know, which, which is already uh, in, uh, brought about by the pandemic. Now it needs to be seen to what extent India is likely to take up the responsibility to become the engine of economic growth and steer South Asia out of this. And, but, this could also be an this crisis could also be an opportunity for very interesting uh, lateral benefit sharing models that could come up, and so 
this is not necessarily something that New Delhi only can do. And even if Delhi, for a variety of reasons, chooses to sit this one out, there are interesting opportunities for reviving regional growth that stand at the intersection of federalism and foreign policy. An interesting long-term trend one, one can see in Indian foreign policy is that border states are beginning to localize Indian foreign policy in innovative ways from below. And this is transforming economic geographies and opening economic opportunities for marginalized communities across interland South Asia. A quick example uh, would be a strong impetus for the agreement between India and Bangladesh in 2019 to commence cross-border trade on the Brahmaputra was provided by the border state of Assam um, and its own, uh, driven by its own interest in tapping uh, increased river trade opportunities within the region. And, and what is heartening is also that this is not a one-off. There are many, any number of cross-border interactions within South Asia in health, energy, trade, tourism that are being steered by subnational states, subnational powers. So to conclude, I would say in many ways for Indian foreign policy, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine is a sort of Dickensian moment. It is in many ways both the best and worst of times. While on the one hand, it will push a reluctant India to get out of its comfort zone and step up to the plate. On the other, it also presents India with a unique opportunity to do an imaginative ideational reset that is more aligned with its interests. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kurian. Um, and last but definitely not least, we'll turn to Professor Da for his comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, really my great pleasure. And my, my colleague Lu Yang already uh, elaborated uh, China's uh, position and China, Russia, China, India. So I think I will only add some uh, reflection and thoughts about China's discussion and the debate regarding the Ukraine uh, crisis. I think uh, China's initial response to to the war and to to the crisis was affected was shaped by uh, two uh, two factors. Uh, one is of course China's uh, uh, so-called strategic coordinative uh, partnership with with Russia, uh, particularly China. Uh, I think uh, China is empathetic towards Russia's uh, security uh, situation uh, facing the expansion of NATO and uh, in, in past three decades. And uh, actually China in East Asia uh, has faced a similar uh, security pressure from the US alliances uh, after the end of the Cold War. So that's the reason why China feel kind of uh, sympathy or, or empathy uh, towards Russia. And of course, the other factor uh, is China's uh, very good relations with Ukraine. Um, and also, of course, China's uh, emphasis on uh, the principle of sovereignty. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's true that China and the Ukraine has had very good relations before this war. Um, though I, I already I said China have strategic coordinative partnership with Russia, but actually uh, in past two decades, China and uh, Ukraine had very productive uh, relationship. Um, even sometimes we can say more fruitfully, uh, more fruitful than China, Russia. For instance, um, China, uh, China imported, uh, introduced some Russian uh, weaponry in past decades, but Russia, Russia has always been very reluctant uh, regarding the technology transfer, uh, but Ukraine is, I think, helped China uh, much more than Russian in those two decades. Uh, and of course, China um, paid a, a very great importance to sovereignty because China has Taiwan issue and China, of course, as a country be, uh, be invaded by imperialist in history, really don't like the invention of uh, intervention of other countries' domestic affairs and also 
the, the, the to uh, you know break the principle of sovereignty. So those are the initial uh, response uh, response shaped by these two factors. But later, I think China, uh, as we as the war uh, evolves, I think China uh, was shaped by some other uh, factors, uh, extra uh, factors. Number one is China-U.S. relations. I think China feel, China felt the pressure from the U.S and uh, the u.s uh, government and also the scholars has kept on telling china that china the, that china u.s relations could deteriorate further if china stand with uh, with russia and uh, china u.s relations could be a victim of uh, 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 china's support to uh, claim the china support to to russia and uh, the other thing is uh, the international order. We, we, we began to feel that, uh, to realize that the international order could evolve the into, uh, towards a direction that is harmful, uh, negative to China's interest. The, the, the world could divide it into two camps, uh, China, Russia in one camp, uh, and maybe some other countries. But, Europe, U.S., and other Western country in, in the in the other two camps in, in the other camp. So, if the international order uh, evolves towards that bipolar system, I think that's really not in China's interest. China don't like that very much. The third factor is, of course, the evolution of the the war and also the uh, humanitarian concerns. Uh, after the war, the war, you know, uh, uh, expand and uh, refugee and other things. Uh, the last factor um, I think sh shaped China's uh, further consideration is uh, the uh, I think the response from other countries uh, in the world. Uh, actually, two list of country uh, I think have already uh, catched our eyes. One is most of the country in the world condemned uh, Russia. I think 141 country condemned the US, uh, condemned Russia, uh, while uh, about 35, uh, China uh, and India are among them, uh, abstain, and only five uh, veto, so uh, or reject. So um, that means China don't want to be isolated uh, from other you know, majority countries. But the other list is actually, uh, I will say most of the countries in the world has, have not joined the sanctions uh, over Russia. And those countries who impose sanctions uh, over Russia are mainly Western countries. I think uh, China and its neighboring countries, including India and other countries, have no desire to sanction uh, Russia. So China feels that we should not be isolated, but actually China is not the, China is not the unique country that don't want to sanction Russia. I think India, of course, is uh, uh, probably the most important country that China uh, look at. So, um, being uh, shaped by all those factors. I think China, uh, uh, domestic opinion in China regarding this war is very, very divided in China. This war could be the most uh, controversial issue in China, uh, particularly in China's social media. Um, from very beginning um, to even today, I think if you um, if you have an account uh, of uh, WeChat uh, in China or Weibo in China, you can see people fight against each other. I mean Chinese, uh, they debate very viciously, and uh, and uh, actually uh, the the community of intellectuals divided very much. And I think the reason why China. Chinese intellectual and strategic community is so divided is the reason is not because of the war, not the war itself, or not even it's not China-Russia relations or China-Ukraine relations. I think the biggest factor player um, behind the scene is China-US relations. So put it simple, China's attitude towards this war 
is shaped mainly by China-US relations. The basic mindset here is uh, since the US pressed China so hard in past four years, and uh, since the US won't have a strategic competition with China, why should we abandon our friend, uh, I mean Russia? Or why should we, uh, a very famous moderator in CGTN, Ms. Liu Xin, uh, uh, tweet, tweeted that, uh, do you want us to, uh, to, 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 to kill uh, my friend, then later you can concentrate to kill me? I think this is the question many Chinese are asking. Uh, are, are we so silly to, to do that? And, and, and of course, um, many people, because they don't like the US policy towards China, they think we should support Russia. So this is a very simple logic. I myself maybe probably won't buy this theory, but I think many people here in China buy this theory. Uh, and uh, of course, we also don't want to uh, lose our strategic credibility. Uh, if you, uh, you know, you have a partnership with a country like Russia, then under, under the pressure from other countries like the US, you abandon your partner. I think that's uh, also very harmful for China's uh, uh, strategic credibility. No need to mention Russia is, Russia is such an important neighbor to our North. So um, I think that explains China's position towards Russia. But of course, uh, China don't like uh, the invasion. China don't want to be put in this dilemma. I will say China is in the dilemma, very difficult uh, tightrope. China don't, want, don't like to walk on the tightrope. And uh, China don't want the world to decouple further because China in past four decades, China achieved its uh, accomplishment basically by integrating into the world, integrate with the Western country. We of course don't want, want it to decouple further while this war could push the world towards decoupling further. So those are all, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the consideration in China. So on the one hand, uh, very bad China-US relations. On the other hand, we want to uh, coupling with the, the world, with the developed world. So that makes China very, very, uh, in a very, very difficult uh, position. Uh, the, the last thing I want to emphasize is um, actually after February 24th, uh, China's position towards this war is, has evolved uh, very, uh, very uh, you know, uh, some some nuance I think the Western world should uh, should uh, should notice. Uh, actually, China's position uh, has changed a little bit. At the very beginning, China um, China emphasis, uh, at the very first day, China only say uh, we need to consider Russia's security concern, and uh, we already noticed that Russia won't attack the city or kill civilian. But on the I think on the third day, China began to emphasize. Uh, the principle of sovereignty and put it as number one position of China. And then we put Russia's security concern as second, uh, second uh, uh, guideline. So make it, I won't say it's second place, but principle of the sovereignty is always being uh, mentioned first. And uh, then later, I think China's ambassador to the US, Mr. Ambassador Qingang, also say, uh, yeah, there's no, uh, no, no limit. Uh, actually, it's not uh, China-Russia uh, partnership is not uh, unlimited. I will say China, there's no ceiling of cooperation. I think that's, it's, that is a more accurate translation. Um, of course, we don't have ceiling with uh, any countries. We don't have ceiling, but Ambassador Qin said that we have the bottom line, or you can say we have floor. Right, we we don't have a ceiling of China Russia relationship, but we have a flaw. The flaw is UN Charter is the uh, um, sovereign principle of sovereignty. So that already implied the China's you know very new the nuance in China's position. So um, to sum up, I think China shaped by all those interests by all those thoughts, China is in a quite difficult position, but. I hope that the uh, uh, observer outside China can also notice 
uh, China's uh, 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 ev evolution, uh, this position of the evolution, and also China's effort try to shift the focus from whether we should condemn Russia or not into humanitarian issue, uh, issues uh, or ceasefire and this kind of thing. We think this is more meaningful. We should not focus on those uh, uh, you know, condemning thing uh, may, probably are more meaningful uh, issues like, uh, yeah, humanitarian aid and the negotiations. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you, and I look forward for further discussion and the questions. Thank you very much, um, Professor Da, and thank you to all four panelists for those very thoughtful remarks, which provide insights into why the responses from India and China have been what they have. Um, but I'm now going to turn it over to my co-director, Mark Fraser, for the Q&A session. Um, I do want to encourage all our audience members to put in their questions in the Q&A box. But Mark, over to you now. Thank you, Manjuri. And, and thanks to each of our, our panelists for some really interesting points that I want to uh, revisit in, in, over the next uh, few questions. And I, again, also invite uh, the audience to please uh, drop your, your questions in, in chat. Um, and and this, this may be more for, uh, for Professor Da and Professor Liu, but, but I invite Ambassador Sarn and Professor Kurian to also uh, add their thoughts on this. Um, I noted a, a, an op-ed that appeared in the Washington Post last weekend by the famous uh, international relations scholar, co-authored uh, Graham Allison and, and a co-authored with Fred Hu in which uh, they proposed that uh, China uh, having, you know, being the largest trading partner with, with Russia and Ukraine, uh, having um, a, lot of, a lot more leverage uh, over both Russia and Ukraine than I think is, is often claimed, uh, could uh, stand as a kind of mediator in the conflict. It, it would, you know, for, for besides uh, having the leverage, China also, uh, I think you could argue, they argued, and I agree with them, it's in China's interests to uh, help bring about an end to this conflict. And if it's successful, if the effort is successful, it would, of course, come with some great reputational and other kinds of rise in, in, in global standing if China were to act as the, as the peacemaker here, in addition to, you know, for more self-interested reasons, um, dampening these uh, global uh, effects on, on inflation, on supply chains, on food security, on financial uh, insecurities uh, that have stemmed from the war. So, um, you know, it is, I, I guess uh, we have, we're very lucky to have kind of two, I'll call them insiders, they may not agree with me, but is this uh, a proposition being considered uh, seriously uh, in Beijing policymaking circles for China to, to step in and, and act as a, as a mediator? in a conflict that's almost two months old now. Luyang, do you want to go, go, go first? Okay, okay. Then I, I will share my views on these questions. Um, I think uh, China has uh, held a policy of non-interventions uh, and this uh, position hasn't been changed. And we, we look at current uh, Ukraine and Russia crisis and what uh, the role that, that uh, Russia is playing and the role that the United States is playing. So uh, many Chinese analysts, they're thinking that these two are actually uh, the, the most independent uh, actors in the international systems. Although we think uh, Russia is, uh, um, is a, a superpower in the past time, and currently Russia's GDP is comparable to only to a, a province, uh, a Shandong province uh, um, of China. But still, uh, Russia has the legacy of the previous Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, and it has a global view. Uh, it shares uh, this view and these these ideal, um, this kind of capability um, of acting globally, and this is why. Um, 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 we will say and look at the reactions uh, of China and look at the reactions of the European Union, we would 
uh, we we agree that we are still secondary actors in the international relations. It, we could not act so independently like what Russia and uh, United States uh, has uh, have done. And with um, regards uh, to Russia's uh, uh, currently um, these uh, this kind of uh, involvement in the region. And we see that um, China, as I mentioned, China still uh, be very cautious. I would quite agree that China could be a very good mediator because China has, um, has a very good relationship with Russia and with Ukraine. And, and in some other kind is regional conference that people or, or other international countries, uh, international Actors also share the views that China could be the mediator, but China, um, China is a country that its its uh, foreign policy is actually followed its uh, domestic policy. It serves for the uh, purpose of domestic policies. In this um, current uh, situation or in current um, stage, I think China still be very very careful. Although we are thinking about to build this kind of capability. But until we can reach so far, I think it's still, it will still take time. Um, but um, maybe in the next 10, uh, in this next generation, after 10 or 20 years, but not right now. Uh, okay, the capability will... we have, but the, the willingness we do not have, I would say that. Uh, I have, uh, I'll add a few points to uh, what Luyang said. Uh, some uh, similar, some maybe different. I think first uh, uh, about the experience. Uh, I think I agree with Luyang that China uh, lacked the experience as a mediator. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, traditionally China has, has not paid, played this role, but uh, about uh, after the war uh, broke out, I think there are some discussion among scholars at least, and probably among some officials about what kind of mediating role China can play. I think I heard that kind of discussion and I myself also participate in some kind of discussion, but I haven't heard this kind of discussion in past uh, 10 days. I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I mean, probably we feel that this is difficult. You know, you want, uh, besides experience, I think, uh, three other things. Uh, one is the uh, COVID. If you want to uh, play this kind of, you need a shuttle diplomacy, right? You need to visit our senior level diplomats and even political leader need to visit those countries. Uh, that's difficult. Uh, and another thing is, uh, Luya mentioned this, I agree with her very much. Um, major powers won't accept mediation. Like imagine uh, when U.S. launch a war and you face some problems like U.S. in, in Iraq, for, for instance, will the U.S. accept any kind of mediation? I doubt, uh, I don't think so. And I think uh, major power are all so proud that they can never uh, accept this kind of thing. Uh, I think Russia won't accept this. And the thirdly, um, if we f study the theory of uh, this kind of, uh, 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 a negotiation. Uh, negotiation, ne negotiation uh, requires painful stalemate as a precondition, painful stalemate in the battlefield. So if the two sides of the conflict feel they are in a very painful stalemate, they cannot win the conflict and they are paying high prices, they are like more likely to accept uh, mediation. But now I think the situation in the battlefield is developing and the Russia is moving its troop to East Ukraine. And we may see an even larger scale of conflict in Eastern Ukraine. So I think we are, the, the, I'm, I'm very sad to say this, but the timing of negotiation probably is not mature enough. Uh, that's my two cents, thank you. And would Professor Kurian or Ambassador Saran uh, have any uh, thoughts on, on this question of, of someone playing a, a mediating, mediating role? Um, yeah, let, let me go ahead. 
<laughs> okay, uh, th thank you, Ambassador Seven. Um, Mark, I think um, since our Chinese, uh, Yanglu, and uh, we've had interesting comments from our Chinese colleagues, I, I let me um, widen the uh, you know the the discussion a little bit to see um, what are the interesting takeaways from ongoing efforts at mediation in terms of what has worked and what hasn't. Uh, so, for instance, uh, look at the role that Turkey is playing. Turkey could have been in a quandary as two ostensible, um, uh, you know, two ostensibly uh, allies uh, of Turkey fought a dev devastating war. But instead, Turkey, which is a NATO member, continues to supply weapons to Ukraine while refusing to sanction Russia and appears to be respected by both sides enough to at least host talks. So, and this interestingly is in contrast to the role, for instance, that Israel uh, has tried to play as an interlocutor. And we, we have the Israeli Prime Minister Bennett's 15 point uh, peace plan, uh, which is not, um, which is very clearly strongly, you know, rejected by the Ukrainians because it, it, it involved denying Ukraine the right to join the NATO and disallowing any foreign, foreign troops on its soil. It was rejected by the Ukrainians for being too pro uh, too pro Russia. So, so I think some of the red lines that um, in this um, uh, you know fast moving crisis, one can kind of uh, there are takeaways here of, of what, what what has worked and what is uh, and what hasn't. <clears throat> Okay, um, we, we can move on to some questions that have been coming into the Q&A box. Um, and uh, first from a, a student here at the New School, Bai Yi Du. Uh, it's a question for Professor Da, but anyone can, can also join uh, in an answer. Uh, and it is um, uh, posed this way. Can we conclude that the division of Chinese attitudes um, as that Professor Da talked about, especially, the division of, of, of attitudes towards the war in China, is this due to an ideological clash uh, between China's uh, liberalism uh, idea uh, slash propaganda that stable international institutions and structures is so fundamental and also deeply rooted realistic view of the world, including social Darwinism and balance of power? I think, uh, I think what he's getting at there is that uh, is, are these arguments that, that are, are one famously sees on, on social media among ordinary citizens, is this rooted in an ideological division within China between those who, who I, are, are, as he puts it, um, more liberal and indeed perhaps pro-Western versus those who are uh, you know, looking at things from a more a realist perspective, social Darwinism type of view of, of a hardcore balance of power. So do we have do we have IR theory in, in Chinese society <laughs> dividing? Uh, shall I uh, answer it now or? Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, by uh, very interesting uh, question. Uh, to some extent, I agree with your summary that this is clash of the two uh, two ideology or two idea. Uh, well, uh, but uh, probably if it's me, I won't uh, put it in that way. I think it's not uh, uh, China's long-term liberalism idea or propaganda. I think it's from uh, the very uh, fundamental uh, uh, idea in China, uh, in which has which has formed in past four decades. That is, China need to uh, integrate into the the whole world or keep this kind of integration, the, the interconnectedness, the interconnectedness. Of course, you can say this is liberal uh, liberalism. Uh, I won't oppose that. But uh, in China, we I think people uh, rarely use this term. Uh, but very uh, uh, fundamental belief of many uh, Chinese, uh, they believe that China need to uh, keep this interconnectedness. And in the, if, uh, in that if we are we can have this kind of interconnectedness uh, and if we can uh, the current uh, or the old uh, so-called liberal international order will continue china could grow i think this is the old belief but it, it has been changed uh, not only by the uh, russia actually it's also changed uh, uh, challenged by 
the reality uh, in the uh, Trump administration during the Trump administration, right? Uh, China already see that probably this kind of order won't exist. All this kind of order want to exclude China. So uh, if so, uh, why should we try to keep this interconnectedness uh, with the uh, outside world? So, um, so um, the new reality versus the old belief, I will say this is a challenge. Uh, so, uh, but I think what you, I, I, I partly agree with your summary. I think that's also a very good uh, uh, summary of the, uh, the, the, the dilemma we are facing. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I want to return to, well, I, I'll, I'll put it this way, return, and returning to a point that Ambassador Sarin made, which is that, um, uh, you know, as he put it so succinctly, that uh, Russia has already lost this war. And um, I would like to hear uh, if, if others agree with that. Professor Dodd just mentioned that uh, there, there is a lot of evidence of, of you know, mobilization, uh, reorientation of Russia's military uh, forces uh, to uh, kind of renew an attack on, on eastern, southeastern Ukraine. Uh, and in that sense, um, Russia doesn't seem to be acting as though it has, has, has lost the war. But um, it, I would also add that, you know, the longer this conflict goes on, I think that, as I've tried to suggest, there are, you know, a lot of, uh, of you know, as the war goes on and as atrocities quite possibly tend to increase and accumulate and evidence of, of <laughs> war crimes increase, uh, that uh, this is going to be you know, quite costly for uh, countries like India and China that continue to um, you know, engage as, as Professor Curian mentioned in you know, the, the politics of ambivalence, or as she said, ambivalence by design. Uh, anyway, uh, your, your thoughts on, you know, the ways in which you agree or disagree, the evidence uh, uh, for and against the proposition that Russia has already lost this war. Uh, can I say something? <laughs> Sorry. <Sure. clears throat> yeah, uh, I think uh, um, my first response was uh, 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 the same uh, with Ambassador. I think uh, I... In other uh, meetings, I also uh, elaborate this point. I think China already lost uh, the war. Not, uh, I, I think the the, the uh, Russians are not. I'm not saying that they have they have already lost in the battlefield, or they they already lost the war per se. But they already lost strategically. I mean, no matter what kind of situation in the battlefield is. Russia is unplugged from the uh, the international system. I think that is mm, not in Russia's long term interest. If if we believe that uh, a country's uh, long term future and uh, and the welfare depends on this, uh, you know, inter integration and economic welfare. Uh, having said that, I I. I, I began to change my view a little bit in recent uh, couple of days. I think Russia may have my, Russia may have different logic uh, from what I described. Uh, some Russian Russian scholar talked about uh, constructive destruction. Uh, Russia may maybe believe Russian maybe believe that by destruction they can dis, destruct you know from the destruction they can gain some benefit. So the, if the old, they believe that the old order is not in their interest, so they better disrupt the, uh, you know, topple down the old order, then they can gain something from that. So um, that is far from China's worldview, but I think this is the worldview of many Russians. If you from that criteria, they won't say, they won't admit that they already lost. But again, I agree with, I personally agree with Ambassador, I think they already lost. Also, maybe I also add to some. Uh, um, Ambassador Saran, would you go first? Uh, no, I, I uh, you know, whatever may be the logic our Russian friends may use uh, to justify uh, what has uh, the outcome, uh, I think by any metric of power, realist or otherwise, uh, I cannot see any objective, any rational objective 
that would have been achieved even if there are battles on the ground which Russia wins. So, um, uh, you know, if you are going to leave behind a Ukraine, which is a substantial country, it is the largest country in Europe. If you are going to leave that country in total ruin and say, well, this was our objective. We want, wanted to show that we can make a rubble out of you. Uh, I cannot see how that can count in terms of any rational, uh, you know, metric of power, as I said, uh, as a success. No? And the other factor which has been mentioned that uh, Russia has been unplugged from the global system. We may not like the global system. We may not like the fact that the financial sector is dominated by the West, that the dollar continues to be an international currency. We may not like that. And I mentioned that this causes considerable anxiety and concern to us. But the fact is that that is the reality. Now, if you're going to be unplugged from that, it is a huge setback. And I think our Chinese friends would also be mindful of the fact that they would not like to do anything which may lead to that kind of a possibility in the future. So this is something that uh, I think uh, whatever may be the outcome, uh, I cannot see this having a, a result which in any way can be counted as a, uh, as a success. Uh, Russia is already a very diminished power. Uh, it, has a, it has a GDP which is less than that of India. Uh, you know, it is, it is as somebody said, uh, not even one province of China <laughs> has, has a GDP uh, that Russia has. Um, its demographics are declining. It may be a resource-rich uh, country, but that resource needs to have a market, has to be linked to a market. If those markets are interrupted, then what does that resource richness mean? It is a nuclear power. But you know, I mean, brinkmanship, nuclear brinkmanship will take you only this far and no further. So I think um, my view is that, you know, uh, we, we are probably going to be facing a, a very uh, altered geopolitical landscape. Where Russia, I doubt now whether Russia will in fact continue to be a major player on the international, on the international uh, arena. Uh, I certainly do believe that it will be far more dependent upon its strategic partnership with uh, Russia, uh, with China. And uh, in terms of India's relationship with Russia, it was already diminishing. India-Russia relations are not Indo-Soviet relations. I think people make the mistake of looking at India-Russia relations today and you know, trying to sort of uh, you know, compare it to Indo-Soviet relations, not. So Indo-Russian Indo relations have been on a decline since the end of the Cold War. The strategic glue which held India and the Soviet Union together does not apply anymore. India and Russia do not have, you know, their, their economic relations are marginal. Even this business of, you know, buying oil from, from Russia, what India buys in a whole month may be less than what Germany or European countries may be buying in a day. So, uh, you know, th this, these realities are not being taken into account that India-Russia relations, whatever may be the legacy, whatever may be the sentiment, and there are real issues. I mean, the issues that I mentioned of, uh, you know, the legacy of our, you know, very major assets, uh, military assets, uh, still being serviced by uh, Russia, and also by Ukraine, as I mentioned. Um, there are technologies which Russia has been ready to share with us, which others are not ready to share with us. So we have to take uh, that into account. Um, you know, I don't think people should because of the normative issues that Nimi has been mentioning, uh, normative issues are important, but I think countries, you know, uh, interests, real interests are also very important. We always have to, as a practitioner, I would say <laughs> that, you know, one has always had to balance, you know, the normative with the realist, uh, you know, compulsions that a country has. So we should not, uh, you know, we should not uh, sort of decry those, those realist, uh, you know, compulsions which countries have to uh, deal with. It may be all very well to talk about the normative issues, but 
we have seen even the countries which are talking about you know uh, democracies what autocracy don't forget that in 1972 nixon went to shake hands with mao who had the blood of 30 million chinese uh, on his hands you know that did not prevent uh, that alliance from <laughs> from taking place uh, so you know the countries uh, yes sometimes dress up their interests in moralist tones in ethical tones but we also have to understand that there are certain uh, real real compulsions which drive uh, countries foreign policy now having said that i do believe that india's longer term interest perhaps going forward will be even less linked to russia uh, than they have been in the past that is the uh, trend which i see uh, for the future now what does this mean for india's relations with the united states of america what does it mean for its relations with china uh, remains to be seen there are people now talking about how the non aligned movement should <laughs> perhaps be revived uh, that we should be talking about you know the interests of the global south which uh, is being impacted very badly for something which they are not responsible you know the food crisis in uh, in africa for example or the energy crisis that most of the countries in the south are facing uh, perhaps we need to uh, come together again and and make certain that our interests are not uh, you know violated in the manner that they are being done so uh, uh, to repeat one i think uh, i repeat that russia has lost the war even if it is going to win some more battles uh, number 2 Russia is going to emerge from this a much more diminished power than it has already been. Number three, the longer-term trend of India's relations with Russia consistently getting more and more diluted is probably going to be accelerated. And number four, I think India will be faced with very difficult choices in terms of what kind of strategic partnerships are going to uh, really be in its best interest. uh should it continue to strengthen its relationship with say the united states and you know the quad is one example uh are there ways in which uh, india and china can perhaps come to a new understanding a mention was made that um, china is perhaps looking at india not always through the china us prism that is very welcome news but we don't see much of that reflection on the ground uh, so uh, if we can if we can take that particular you know aspect forward i think it would be in the interest of both india and china thank you very much hey, on that point we have a good a, a question on the point about the kind of food security question and and um so this is from uh, teddy stall who says what are china's and india's perspectives on the inflationary effects of the, the war in their respective neighborhoods uh, specifically in relation to the recent instability in in sri lanka Uh, foreign cur foreign currency reserve depletion in Nepal. Uh, I guess I could extend the question to to uh, you know China's BRI investments in Central Asia, Middle East, Northern Africa, where these food security issues are going to be uh, you know are already present and they're going to get worse. Uh, what actions can each country, China and India, take to help um, combat or as 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 uh, Teddy says, combat these issues? Uh, or one could also add to it, um, you know, prevent or uh, alleviate uh, these uh, these potential uh, humanitarian issues when it comes to food security. So gets I may just uh, the, yeah. just uh, uh, add that uh, India is already uh, extending considerable amount of support to Sri Lanka, uh, both in terms of uh, food assistance, but also in terms of you know. making available soft lines uh, to deal with the foreign exchange crisis that uh, sri lanka is uh, facing but uh, let us not uh, forget it's a very pervasive crisis uh, so um, you, you know i i don't think that uh, despite india being the larger country it can uh, sort of uh, bankroll uh, you know uh, sri lankan recovery but i think to the extent that it is possible uh, india has in fact extended considerable amount of support to sri lanka i personally think india should do much more uh, i think i look upon this as an opportunity uh, to really really sort of promote uh, the kind of uh, thing that uh, nimi was mentioning uh, can india really become the engine of growth for the entire uh, region uh, similarly for uh, uh, nepal uh, i think there has been concerns in india uh, with the uh, you know uh, chinese activities in our neighborhood and uh, to the extent that uh, these countries in the neighborhood are beginning to reassess 
the cost of say being part and parcel of BRI and are looking to India uh, to see whether or not you know perhaps uh, there can be a, a lowering of the risks that they are facing. Uh, I think uh, it is it is in India's interest that we should respond positively uh, to that. Uh, so the uh, Nepali Prime Minister was in India recently, and I think the result of that particular visit was very positive. And I think that there could be uh, an opportunity uh, for both uh, the the political aspect and the economic aspect uh, being sort of re reoriented. Uh, in a direction that would make India somewhat more comfortable than it has been. Um, so I can also add to uh, these uh, some points to these questions, and China also uh, um, uh, um, support the humanitarian uh, um, assistance, um, and it has. Um, um, assistance uh, to uh, its neighboring countries as well, and uh, emphasize uh, it will help uh, the other countries uh, that is affected. And as uh, Ambassador um, uh, Saran uh, mentioned uh, that uh, China did it accordingly, and China recently visited uh, South Asian countries, China's uh, um, China's um, um, Foreign Secretary um, Wang Yi visited uh, uh, Nepal and also visited uh, Pakistan um, um, and also uh, coordinated uh, the, um, uh, um, the, the Islamic uh, organizations, uh, uh, coordinated the the uh, Afghanistan talk, uh, which China also put lots of efforts in playing a mediator and sent lots of humanitarian assistance uh, to Afghanistan. Um, I would say that uh, currently uh, we look at the China's uh, uh, foreign aids project. Uh, China uh, has uh, shifted uh, because previously, I think in past uh, uh, a couple of decades, uh, these foreign uh, aids projects haven't been uh, have China uh, did not attach so much importance on its. Uh, Boring AIDS project, but it has shifted uh, its uh, its policy, and uh, and also uh, China is uh, um, it's uh, is the host country of uh, BRICS uh, summit, which will be it will soon coming. May I think it will be at in the middle of this year. On um, um, this is uh, if we look at the BRICS summit uh, and all these BRICS states, it's uh, it's all all, st uh, all states in BRICS are regional powers, and um, and there is also a mechanism of um, BRICS plus, which means uh, it's a platform of all of all these regional powers as well as uh, 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 others. Um, countries uh, in the regions and which means this is also a platform for the global thought and I think in terms of the, the humanitarian systems maybe uh, we can do a lot uh, both China and India um, we can do a lot uh, within these mechanisms and uh, to, to, to further coordinate uh, their their um, their positions and also um, to think about uh, how to uh, how to do the uh, how to to give some support uh, now to the global source uh, on these food crisis as well as the, the COVID nineteen and the health health issues uh, etc. Thank you. Okay, I've got. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to combine uh, two uh, audience questions, and these uh, are important uh, questions that people are raising about uh, the semantics and and, and uh, the words we use in talking about uh, what we're talking about today. And so this comes from uh, Ina Sukenko, who says uh, to Professor Liu, "Will you please be so kind as to comment on your choice of defining the Russian war in Ukraine?" Uh, which more and more political leaders tend to define as genocide. Uh, why, why are you choosing to call it a conflict or the Ukrainian crisis, which 
the Russian government also, and the Chinese government has generally tended to call it the Ukraine uh, crisis. The second uh, related question comes from a student also here at the New School who is also from Ukraine. His name is Ihor Andrichuk. And he says, thank you for your illuminating comments. Uh, being no expert in foreign policy, I do have a question about the concepts already used. How different is non-interference in the war from, for instance, declaring strong neutrality? What are the implications of conceptual choices of this sort between non-interference uh, versus uh, strong neutrality? So, uh, Professor Liu, uh, the, there was one question directed to you on, on calling it the Ukrainian crisis versus the Russian war in Ukraine, and to any others uh, who want to talk about um, the, the differences between non-interference, neutrality, and, and other kinds of ways in which uh, the positions of China and India have been described. Um, and I, I would um, answer the questions that is about the weapons and the importing to the uh, to the Ukraine, right? Uh, not the weapons. It's just that that uh, I noticed in your remarks you were you were calling it the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, and uh, it's it's the strong preference of 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 many, and especially Ukrainians, to not call it a crisis, but a a war, an invasion of their country. So so why why do why do we hear and see in Chinese media and in commentators uh, so often this term being used as the Ukrainian crisis rather than the war? You know, we didn't. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway, this Japan is, invade, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's enough. I mean, my my preference it's not because because English is not my mother tongue. Sometimes I use crisis. Sometimes I, I I use uh, war. This is uh, this is only my preference. Sometimes I I shift it between words. <laughs> okay, thank you. But yeah. I think it is actually a war. It's a, it's a, it's it's not because we think about conflict. Conflict that you have many kinds, but now. Uh, it's a war. It's a, uh, Ukraine is in a war situation. Okay, thank you. And, and others on, you know, is there a difference between uh, neutrality and non-interference? I think, uh, I, I don't know the, the context of this question. Uh, uh, China, I think non-interference related to the policy that China usually China won't interfere other countries' domestic politics. I think that um, you sometimes uh, non-interference uh, principle be mistakenly understood as China won't uh, do anything outside the outside border or uh, mm -hmm. do anything with other countries. I think that's wrong. I think uh, 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 non-interference is like, uh, you know, in the election in the US, you have two parties, you know, uh, run for presidents and we won't interfere with that kind of election. I think that's the, what is non-interference is. And the uh, neutrality, I think in this war or in this crisis, no matter how you call it, China is in the position of, uh, I will say neutrality because uh, two countries, both countries are our friends, so it's too hard to make a to make a choice. Uh, and uh, related to Lu Yang's uh, 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 the the question that Lu Yang answered, I think another issue uh, the outside uh, uh, audience, foreign audience, don't understand is uh, in Chinese. Uh, in Chinese, invasion is a very strong, uh, very strong accusation. It's much more stronger than, it's much stronger than 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 it in English. Uh, so when you say invasion in English, it's not so uh, strong expression. Uh, I when I read U.S. newspapers, sometimes. U.S. newspapers say U.S. invaded Iraq, invaded Afghanistan, uh, invaded other. So basically, it means your 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 troops uh, entered another country. I think uh, without invitation, right? Uh, but in Chinese, invasion is a very strong accusation. So uh, uh, many foreign uh, correspondent ask a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson why China refused to use invasion. 
Mm -hmm. I think this culture uh, differences need to be noticed. Um, so in Chinese, invasion is Ru Qin. Ru Qin is very, very immortal. So it's hard for China to use such a strong word. Uh, but we don't like the war. Let me put it very simple and very clearly. We don't support the war. We don't like the war. Um, of course, we don't support the war against uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so, so would would the Chinese word for in, uh, that, that you just mentioned, Professor Dot, is there a historical example in which that which Chinese spokespeople or, or that that terminology would be used? Of, of um, in uh, Ru Qin or invasion, Ru Qin, like, yes. like Japan invaded China in World War Two. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, this kind of thing. Um, so um, very strong. So, but but Russia isn't uh, doing a routine on Ukraine right now. It seems that you know people could certainly say that 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 term is used. And indeed, I thought about 1937. Yeah, um, yeah, in, because, in because at... in China, yeah, I, I understand that in in the U.S. or in European context, that's just reminds people the experience of World War II. But yeah. in China, as I said, we are in another context. So we think about the expansion of the NATO. The you know. It's kind of, we call it legitimate security concern. Uh, I think, uh, I think though I'm, I oppose this invasion, but I, I do think the West made a serious mistake by press Russia too hard. Uh, I think that's, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I oppose that invasion, but I do understand why Russia uh, view the situation in that way. I understand that. And, and I'd like, I mean, I, I just want to respond to that by saying, um, because something is predictable, you know, that there's a security, a security problem that's been created over 20 years, it doesn't mean that the actions taken to address that security concern is justifiable. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we can strongly condemn, we should strongly, I'm speaking personally, not for the Indian China Institute, but I'd strongly condemn Russia's behavior, while I can also say that you know that 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 there were some predictable insecurity uh, concerns raised, but I, I can can say that it's in no way justifiable the decisions that have been taken. Um, yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah. Other other thoughts or comments before I go to the next question, so, Nimi, uh, please. So I think that's a great question. Uh, uh, you know, Mark um, from the student, and I it no I can't really think of a very uh, comprehensive answer, but the quick response would be, I think the fundamental difference between neutrality and non-intervention um, interference, um, you know, at a conceptual level would be neutrality, I would say, think is more of a legal concept. It's like a legal status arising from the abstention of a state from all participation in a war between other states. Like and Switzerland, quick, or, yeah. Sorry? I was going to say, like, like Switzerland has the, the famous you know, yes, neutrality. A quick example would be Austria, yeah. Austria, Finland, Sweden. Incidentally, are members of the EU, but are legally bound by neutrality, constitutionally, and 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 non-interventionist and uh, non-interference or non-intervention would be more of a political philosophy or a national foreign policy doctrine that opposes inter interference in the domestic politics and affairs of other countries. So that I would think is the crux of the difference between the two. Um, so, so maybe I just add to our uh, questions uh, raised uh, um, previously on, on, uh, on Professor Dawi's understanding of Russian's um, worldview. And I also quite agreed with this um, these, um, um, view. And also, if we, we would say that Russia as an actor, it's a, it, 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 it's a, as a country, it indeed, uh, lost the war. It could be excluded for the unplotted and also it be excluded from the current uh, UN security. Uh, councils and we lost the previous uh, power as it it has uh, um, uh, in the past. But um, just we should think about the the, the ideological uh, legacy of the Soviet Union because uh, they will say that uh, peace would comes 
And through destruction and through the war, uh, if we look at previous, um, I, I could not remember which Soviet leader has, uh, has written these, but there is some very famous statement that about war and peace. And if, um, and, and, and if we think about Russia, it has its kind of ideological view that it will save the global, uh, the, co the communist views of these, and it could be sacrificed. And we was uh, itself, and look at the new orders that were coming out of it. Because if you look at, at the current, uh, it's a very crucial uh, juncture. And what kinds of uh, international order would come out of that? Uh, it would not be the previous one. Previous one, we have a unilateral um, the, the systems uh, for, for 20, 20, uh, 30 decades, um, 20, 20 or 30, uh, two or three decades already. But there could be a kind of uh, mixture of uh, previous oh, yeah. old war, or is some kind of uh, some kinds of new things. If it could be uh, these old order could be uh, destructed, I think uh, in this sense, um, um, in uh, Russia's understanding, it will not be a loser. And if we look at the financial systems uh, in the uh, in future, uh, the currently uh, the United States used uh, and and European Union used uh, um, the, these uh, sanctions and used do U.S. dollar and Europe euros as a weapons to uh, uh, as a weapons and which makes the bulk commodity actually uh, we we have the uh, the previous financial system and U.S. power is based on these uh, on, on U.S. dollars, and now we see that buy community has become so important, and the U.S. dollars. I don't know uh, uh, um, how it will come out of that, but there's uh, so many uh, exchange of currency. Uh, exchange of commodities through currency that it excluded U.S. dollars, and it could, uh, uh, and I think this would change the uh, the financial systems globally, and uh, and U.S. dollars would not be so dominated in future. This is why I would say, if we look at these financial orders and look at the uh, the uh, international orders in future, I would say if Russia is a it's destructor. It's playing a destructive power, and if in this sense it can move towards a direction that with that could be more fair international order, that will be in Russia's interest, and that Russia would not be a loser and totally loser for this sense. Yes. Okay. Uh Back Sorry, to you, Ambas for a question. Ambassador Saren, and I think Ambassador Saren wants to come in, and then maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, uh, no, I, I, uh, sure. I uh, if if we, uh, if we are finishing, then I, I don't. No, we're not finishing. Uh, she just had a question. We we, we have yeah. we still have fifteen minutes or so. Uh, I see. Okay. No, I was uh, just going to respond to what uh, what uh, Lou has uh, just said. Uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I cannot see, um, you know, even if the destruction that uh, is being wrought by what Russia has done in Ukraine uh, leads to, for example, uh, a lesser dependence on the US uh, dollar, if it leads to more countries being sensitive to, for example, the impact of uh, sanctions being imposed for political reasons. Um, I uh, even if that is if even if that is the trend which may come about, <laughs> I cannot see Russia, you know, uh, gaining from that. Uh, you know, by the time that happens, uh, as I said, the diminishing of Russia is going to not only continue; it would have received a huge setback as a result, both of the cost of this war, as well as. Uh, you know, the uh, damage which is being done to the Russian economy as a result of these sweeping uh, sanctions, both financial as well as trade. So if the, the Russians are thinking that, oh, 
let us you know hurt ourselves so that the world can be better i'm sorry i do not <laughs> i cannot accept that uh, kind of an ideological you know argument that uh, ideology is leading us to you know um, uh, inflict pain on ourselves so that the world may be a better world uh, that we live in uh, i don't think that is a very realistic uh, kind of a kind of a uh, scenario uh, so uh, that's why i'm saying that uh, uh, you know, a lot of changes are going to come about as a result of the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, Europe will not be the same again. Uh, no doubt about that. Now, uh, in Europe, for example, um, this has led to a Germany which has essentially been an economic power to become today, whether it likes it or not, a major political power. It is going to be the dominating power in Europe. What does that mean for Europe? These are question marks. We don't know. You know? Uh, because the Second World War led Germany to play a very, very low key role, a very modest kind of role by choice. Now that is going to change, whether we like it or not. What does that mean for Europe? We don't know. Secondly, as I said, even if some people think that this is going to lead to a revival of US power, as, or, and even in fact, like a hyper power, uh, uh, that is simply not going to happen. Because there are longer term trends which are leading the United States to become, relatively speaking, as I, I'm, and, and I stress that word, relatively speaking, a lesser power than it has been during the, during the years of its uh, uh, you know, unipolarity in, in, in a sense. Uh, the uh, domestic situation in the United States of America is also a big question mark. We don't know whether, you know, at the next election, is there going to be a Trump who's going to come back and all the, you know, assumptions that we are making today may be uh, proved to be, you know, in fact, uh, not valid at all. Uh, we don't simply do not know. What is going to be the impact on China? Now, my reading at this point is that China may on balance come out stronger. Uh, but that may be not right. Because one thing which the Ukrainian crisis has done is to inflict pain all around. So I don't think any country has actually come out of this uh, as a gamer uh, in, in, in a sense. Uh, and I think China is also uh, damaged as a result. Uh, as Professor Dave mentioned that uh, you know, China's prosperity is based on its closer integration with the global economy. China's prosperity, and I may add, India's prosperity is a creature of globalization. If that globalization is going to be interrupted, is going to go into decline, uh, this has major implications uh, for our uh, future economic uh, development. Uh, so there are many, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry to say this, but <laughs> there are many more question marks uh, than answers that we have at this point of time. But one thing is certain that the world after the Ukraine war is going to be a very, very different geopolitical landscape from what we have been used to. And I think, uh, you know, the, the tragedy to me is that precisely at a time when most of the challenges which are being faced by countries uh, and not just you know, developing countries like India and China, but most of the challenges are actually cross-border in character. These are, these are, these are uh, challenges which are global in dimension. We see the pandemic itself. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the big problems why the pandemic is still ongoing is because there are large numbers of people in the world who have not been vaccinated while some are being vaccinated five, four times, five times, you know, uh, that is this kind of vaccine nationalism is not going to deliver the answer to a pandemic. Climate change is another major, major issue. The only way that you can deal with an issue like that is through international collaboration, is through international solidarity. Just when that compulsion has become more urgent, we are actually moving in the reverse direction. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I fear that, uh, you know, we are probably on the threshold of even more, uh, you know, disorder and more, uh, you know, difficult challenges 
than perhaps we had uh, bargained for. And uh, I really do believe that, uh, you know, if relations between countries like India and China, which are two very major, you know, emerging countries, if uh, they could actually put aside some of their differences and work together, they could actually make a positive impact on the international situation. But I'm afraid our Chinese friends look at relations with India through the prism of their relations with the US. They think that, you know, uh, there should be a hierarchical system in Asia and China's, you know, preeminence should be recognized. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that is something that India will find very difficult to accept. Thank you. Andrew, you Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Sir. And in some ways, the question that I've been mulling over follows from your comments. Um, you know, except maybe with the exception of Professor Kurian, most of the panelists have focused on explaining the responses of the governments through the lens of strategic interests. Um, but I want to come back to the question of norms and normative orders. Um, in, in India, very often, um, you know, what Nimid said, India is sitting it out, is explained and justified by pointing to the past misdeeds of the West, the hypocrisy of the United States, of Europe, et cetera, which all should be pointed out and which are all very true. But if we don't use Europe and the United States as always the ultimate way to organize our own moral compass and our own normative framings, um, if we just leave them aside for the time being, does this war in some ways offer an opportunity for India and for China to articulate what their normative framework is going to be for foreign policy, which is not only driven by strategic interests? Uh, In a very well, I, changing I, geopolitical you know, I, landscape. Yeah. I, come, I come back to what I said. You know, uh, I'm speaking as a practitioner. So I'm <laughs> not speaking from the perspective of an academic or somebody who's looking at this uh, in, in very, very uh, justifiably, perhaps, moralist terms. Um, you know, there, there, there are uh, strategic compulsions. Uh, and yes, countries should try and balance their, you know, uh, moral intent, uh, their ethical intent with uh, their strategic compulsions. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, to, to think that somehow we can put that aside and purely focus attention on the normative, I'm afraid, this has not happened before, and I see it unlikely to happen in the future. Now, in terms of uh, the, the current situation, I would say that there is actually a opportunity here where both our strategic interests as well as our ethical interests uh, can be actually aligned. Because I do not think that India's position is that you know, it is okay uh, for the territorial integrity or the sovereignty of another independent country to be violated. Uh, I think that's a misreading of uh, India's situation. I uh, think Ambassador Saran is frozen. Um, he had warned us yeah. that there was a storm going on outside <sighs> his house. So does anybody else want to take up this question? Uh, maybe I can say a point. Uh, I think one thing, uh, one normative thing we can, or China want to advocate, has already advocated is uh, relative security. I think China believe that we can only have security in the relative sense rather than absolute sense. Uh, I think this is something we think is behind this war. Um, you know, Russia feels uh, Russia, Russia feels that uh, it's being threatened by the expansion of NATO. Well, NATO is already a stronger side of this relationship, but uh, it kept on uh, uh, expansion. Uh, well, if two of us, you know, sitting in a room, I have a gun at hand, and you are empty-handed, I think. Uh, that's not a security. Uh, I feel safe, but you don't feel safe. So um, 
China advocate for a relative uh, sense of security. I think that's uh, extremely important. So nobody can enjoy 100% security. I think that will, that is the true uh, security. I think at least that, that is a point that I want to add. Uh, maybe there are some other uh, you know, points. Um, uh, apologies, I, sorry, my, I, my uh, internet connection got interrupted. Apologies. Uh, I would like to add to the comment uh, of um, Manjali. Um, I was, uh, I would say, um, I, I, my personally held view that there will be some new norms uh, come to, come out of it. Um, I think uh, it's very important to change uh, the mindset. Um, we will have a, the, the mindset of the Cold War still affected the current uh, world politics. And if we look at the politicians that are making these decisions, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in the United States, Joe Biden, it's actually, are uh, these are the people that act, uh, when they are young, they are quite involved in these uh, Cold War legacy. Uh, but the currently, uh, so in the, the societal basis or the technological te technology basis of the current world has changed. Uh, we have the uh, we have these, uh, we have already reached an era of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, actually, um, we can communicate it, although the trans border, uh, um, uh, uh, the cross border travel uh, is very big, difficult during the COVID uh, period because of the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, stay in these kind of uh, so video meetings uh, for already three years, but the, the technology uh, give us these possibility that we could still communicate it with each others and these kind of technological uh, so conditions uh, um, we do not have it in the Cold War era, so. Um, I think now uh, we have many uh, um, opportunities uh, to communicate and the, the technological conditions were also, uh, I think it's, it's not, uh, we, we, although there's some, uh, some uh, trends that people just uh, 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 unplotted or, or uh, or the, there's a, another trend against the globalization. But if we look at the communication of scientists of, of, of these kind of changes, there's a still, uh, people are still con closely connected. And these were changed after, the, I think the pandemic, where we we're, we're go, uh, so in maybe next year, two years, uh, in next years, but it will not last forever. This is why I think uh, it is very important to look how to look at each other. If we always think about cold world, and then we stay, we stuck by that, and we look at each other by the the wing wing, or we should uh, we should look at welcome the other countries' development and respect each other. There were some new things come out of it. And with regard to China-India relations, uh, recently uh, uh, Wang Yi visited uh, India and also emphasized that China will not pursue uh, unipolar Asia and it will respect India's um, traditional uh, um, role in the region and will explore Indian-China plus in the region. So I think this kind of how to change the mindset uh, from both sides and to engage a more globalized world, uh, we would definitely not come go back to Cold War, although there's uh, the shadow is, uh, is currently uh, very strong. Um, so this is why I think today's discussions uh, may contribute 
uh, to these kind of new thinking. And this is, uh, this is what I hope. And I think if we do not think it so positively, we always think so passive, uh, passively, then the new orders or a more fairer orders or a, a more fairer norms will not come out. So I think on that wonderful, optimistic note, we should actually wrap up because we are, uh, you know, our time is over. But I do want to take this opportunity to thank each one of our four panelists, Ambassador Saran, mm -hmm. Professor Liu, Professor Da, and Professor Kurian. Thank you very much for your insightful and thoughtful comments. Um, hopefully we'll continue these kinds of conversations in one form or the other. Um, and thank you to all our audience who are zooming in from all around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.